Well, I'm happy to be here with you guys today. I don't every day get to come and speak to a class here at Wake Tech. Um, what's special among the many things about Wake Tech classes is there's so much diversity. There's age diversity, interest diversity. So many of you are going to, if you haven't already done so, eventually start your own businesses. I've spoken to classes here at Wake Tech where there have been students in the room that I felt like I need to go and ask if their mother knew where they were. And there were students in the room that I felt like I need to say yes sir and yes ma'am to. So that age diversity really creates a lot of energy and a great environment for new ideas and brainstorming because where there is more diversity, there's also more creativity. So it's always a, a treat for me to come out and speak to classes. Um, I am the Director of Entrepreneurship Initiatives. I'm part of the Business and Industry Services Group here at Wake Tech. My office is at the Western Wake Campus. And my focus is serving small business owners and entrepreneurs and aspiring small business owners and entrepreneurs. The Triangle area is a very rich area when it comes to small business ownership and entrepreneurship. There's, there are a lot of resources out here. It's almost embarrassing. And it can be a little bit stressful if you're a small business owner starting out, trying to figure out which resources to use, how much money to spend on those resources. So um, 10 years ago when I started my business, it took me months to figure out exactly where to go for what because there was so much to choose from. And if you've never been in business before, you don't know how to decide what to use and what not to use. So one of my objectives today is to help clarify some of that for you. There is a lot out there that's completely and totally free, a lot right here at Wake Tech that a lot of you may not even know about. So, like I said, ask me questions as I go along. Don't let this be a lecture, let's let this be a conversation. There are three types of resources that you have access to as an entrepreneur. And these are broad categories. The first one are your personal resources. Usually when you think about what you need to start a business, you're thinking about what can come from outside of you, from other places. Uh, but your personal resources are very important because that's your basic foundation. And I'll talk about those a little bit more. Your professional resources, all of you have them. All of you have networks. You've done things in the past. You have people that are in your corner. Those are resources as well. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the personal resources, but I'm going to spend most of my time on the community resources, meaning those things that are funded by your state and federal tax dollars. So if you're not using these resources, you're losing money because you've already paid for them. We're going to talk about networking groups and a talk, talk about also mentors and champions that you can create as you go along. Most people start a business doing something that they already know how to do. So that's one of your resources. If you know, already know how to paint, or you know how to draw, or you know how to sew or cook, or you know have some special skill in design or engineering, or um, you know how to build houses, people start their businesses doing things that they know how to do. That's a resource. If you've developed any credentials in those areas, like certifications and degrees, like the ones you guys are pursuing here, those are also resources because they establish your credibility at what you're doing. Then, any past jobs you've had become resources. Some people think that if their past job wasn't exactly in the field that they're going after right now, that that's not really an asset. That's not true. Um, in that job, you learned some things and you met some people that you could probably still use. You develop some skills that are transferable and you can focus on those. So never discard anything that you've done in the past. Go back and look at it and say, how can I use this? How can I adapt that? What am I pulling from that I can use now? When I started my career at IBM just a couple of years ago, um, I started off as a systems engineer. That's a technical job. I don't use much of that technical stuff anymore, but one of the things I did was plan uh, with small businesses on how they were going to automate certain parts of their businesses. So I had to crawl through the business, follow pieces of paper, follow information, figure out where they could be most productive in making some of that, taking the human uh, element out of that. I still use that skill today. So don't discard those past jobs. Look at them and see what you can talk about and what you can pull from that will help you in your entrepreneurial pursuits. And then your ability to communicate. 
Studies have shown that the people who are most successful as entrepreneurs are the ones who communicate the best. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be like Tony Robbins or like your pastor at church, very smooth presenters. It means that you need to have the ability to get your point across. I've spoken to people that split every verb, but at the end of our conversation, I felt comfortable that they knew what they were talking about. And I've spoken to people who are very smooth, very formal, but I didn't have any confidence that they knew what they were talking about. So the ability to communicate is an important skill. Don't make that, don't feel like that's all about being a professional speaker. Characteristics are resources as well. Skills are things that you learn how to do. Characteristics Characteristics are, the, are kind of a way of being or how, the, how you are. One key characteristic that is important to being successful as an entrepreneur is work ethic. Work ethic. If you don't have good work ethic, you won't be successful because nobody becomes an entrepreneur to work less unless they're doing it kind of in semi-retirement where it's not a full-time job. Studies show that when you start a business, you need to be prepared to spend, on average, 50 hours a week. So you go from working 40 hours a week for somebody else to working 50, 55, 60 hours a week for yourself. If you don't have a good work ethic, you won't make it. So you're talking about 12 hours a week, 8 to 12 hours a week, actually doing the work. So imagine that you start a lawn care business. You're going to spend 50% of your time uh, putting ads in, in uh, publications, putting flyers out, contacting builders, contacting uh, homeowners associations, trying to get customers. Then you might spend a day and a half actually doing something in the lawn when you first start out. Now, as you grow, that number may shift, but that strong work, work ethic is what will keep you focused and keep you doing what you need to do. Accountability and responsibility. The 10 magic words of entrepreneurship are, if it is to be, it is up to me. If it is to be, it is up to me. So when you're working a job and you have to do something that requires other people inside the business, you can call Sally up and say, I need this from you. Or you can send an email to Jack and say, I need this from you. And somebody says, what's happening with that project? Well, I left a message to Sally. Send an email to, 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 to Jack and I'm waiting for them because you put the monkey on their back, right? You're waiting for them. But when you are working for yourself, you always have the monkey on your back. And if you're in an environment where you're waiting for uh, something from somebody, you don't just leave a message and wait. If you don't hear back from them in 8, 12, 24 hours, you call them again, or you actually go physically go get it from them. That's a big difference, that level of accountability and responsibility. Ethics are important because you could be working inside of a company and not do things just right and people still keep coming because they have no choice because you're part of the company. They're coming back to the company brand. But when it's your brand, if you don't do things quite right, if you're not totally honest or they feel like you're not totally honest, they won't come back. So that's important. And also resilience and persistence. Everything's not going to be a glowing success. You're going to have some failures. You're going to start down a road and find that that's not working and try something else. Things might fall apart. You'll have to pick it all back up and try again. So resilience and persistence. So these personal resources are very important. I don't know why I keep clicking on the wrong thing. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is image and persona. This is a personal resource as well. Your customers, yes. Sidebar, going back to the last slide, I, I know you were saying that um, you started your own business at some point and it requires a lot more work to yes. you start your business. Um, if you're, you were passionate about the subject of your business, do you find that passion waning over the years based on the amount of work that you had to put into it? How it was now a monetized commodity instead of something? So that's the difference between um, a hobby and a business. Some of the things that we really like doing, 
as a hobby because we get to control how much of it we do, we may not enjoy as a business. You have to somehow make that determination. What I recommend that people do when they're starting a business, if they're not already absolutely sure, is go work in a business like that. See if it really is going to be a passion that will sustain you. For instance, I had a client once who wanted to start a high-end coffee shop. She loved to bake. She had always thought about and dreamed about having her own high-end coffee shop with high-end pastries and people would call and they would lounge around and they would drink her expensive coffee and eat her pastries. Well, I suggested that she go offer herself as an unpaid intern at a high-end coffee shop in another community. She had a chance to see what it was, that, what it was like exactly to be in, immersed in that. And she found that, number one, it took a lot of expensive equipment. Number two, you had to get there really early in the morning to start making those pastries. And if people didn't eat the pastries, then you couldn't claim they were still fresh the next day. What do you do with them? Do you mark them down? Do you throw them away? So she found that this thing that was a great hobby and that she loved and had been dreaming of for years was not something that she really wanted to do as a full-time thing. What she did was she opened up a consignment store and in one corner hung a sign with the name of her coffee shop she'd been dreaming about for years, put some old tables and chairs in there, a coffee pot, and she would bake muffins and cookies, you know, a couple of dozen, and so she got to do both. But it was good for her to learn that lesson up front. Do you know what is required of you from the community and the customers you're going to be working in? This um, persona part, I, I may not have appreciated as much when I first started my business. Now, I came from a corporate environment, so I always kind of dressed corporate maybe a little bit too corporate for the environment that I was working in because I was working, going from a big corporation working with small customers and all of them were not, unless they were insurance salesmen, undertakers and bankers, didn't, were not impressed by my suits. So your image and your persona, your dress, the way you carry yourself, uh, the way you groom yourself, all of that is important because your customers and your prospects want to feel confident that you know what you're doing and what you're talking about. And when it looks like we're not quite taking care of ourselves, it's hard to do that. How many of you have been to a doctor that looked very unhealthy? Did you kind of question whether he could give you any advice? So you want to you wanna make your persona, your carriage, how you dress, you want to make that match what your business is. So if you are a very creative person, and you show up in some in very conservative attire, then they may not feel that you're as creative. But if you're selling into big companies or the government and you dress too creatively, then they they're going to think you kind of you know dizzy, ditzy. Woohoo! Yeah. Do you understand the etiquette in your profession? I mean, how do people interact with each other? Do, does everybody hand out a business card when they first meet you? Or does everybody say, come on, let's sync up with our smartphones? How old is this person that you're gonna, that's going to be making the, the decision about how to hire you or whether to use you? See, I'm running into that now because as much as I love my salt and pepper gray hair, a lot of people that I'm in front of these days I could have given birth to. They may not feel comfortable with the salt and pepper gray hair. They may be looking at me and say, boy, she should be hanging out with my mom. <laughs> right? So you need to be aware of that. At some point, I have to make a connection with them that says, yes, I'm older than you, but we, I consider us peers. And I'm not going to ask you if you're going to stop by the drink or go bar and get a drink or go straight home. I'm not going to try to be your mother. So we have to be aware of that. You know, what is it? What is the etiquette in, in our profession? What's the etiquette in that community? And what's the etiquette at the event? So let's play with image. I found this. When you look at those guys, what business do you think they're in? Weddings. weddings? What doing what at weddings? You think that's these are the, maybe the groom and his Yeah, I know. Okay. Anybody else? Acapella group. Acapella group? Yeah. Anybody else? Doctors. Doctors? Doctors? You think these doctors would be wearing a pink suit? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have made the image bigger. Okay, suppose, 
I'm not wishing any bad luck on anybody, but suppose grandma just passed away and it's up to you to pick the people who are going to handle her body. And these guys showed up in their pink suits. <laughs> you know, they, it could match their hearse. Maybe they have a pink hearse. Um, they just, maybe they love pink, maybe their wives picked out their suits, but for whatever ever reason, the way that they look does not make you feel confident that they know what to do with grandma. I can say this because my relatives are in the funeral business, but see that's important. They look good, but not appropriate as funeral directors. How about this image? <laughs> funeral director. <laughs> yeah, he's the one that's digging the hole, right? <laughs> you guys may not recognize him as Mike Rowe. Yeah, the he's a guy that did the dirty jobs. Now, if he, if he showed up at my house and I had a plumbing leak, I want him because he's dirt, so dirty he would not have a problem crawling under my house, right? But he can't handle grandma. He's too dirty, okay? <laughs> and I probably don't want him as a business consultant because he didn't even bother to get clean up before he came over to talk to me. And I can't see his face. So I don't even know if he's honest. But you know what I mean? So he's, 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 he, there's a certain feeling you get from looking at him. You want him for a dirty job because he's, he's dirty. How about this, this guy? Graphic designer. Graphic designer, right? That's a college student. College student. Well groomed. Yeah. What kind of creative design? Mm hmm. Could be involved in the music entertainment industry. Could be. But if he was your investment banker, if he was trying to sell your retirement plan, maybe not, right? I found this quote, these uh, statements, um, in a business book that I have. Impressions are made in a matter of seconds. They say within five seconds of you walking in the room, the people have already decided what they think about you. Subconsciously, they may not have said, hmm, and made their notes, but there's an image that they now have and you want that to be something that contributes to what you're trying to do and what you're trying to get at. Um, it doesn't mean that they're judgmental. It just means that they have, a, they have a paradigm and when you walk in the room you either fit that or you don't fit it. Now what that means is you, you're not going to be able to impress everybody because you're not responsible for their paradigms. However, you don't want to have your choices about your presentation, your physical presentation, to be a negative. When I started my career, when I could walk into a room full of people and be the only female and the only person of color, making direct eye contact was a problem because I didn't know my place. I wasn't supposed to do that as the only woman in the room and as the only person of color in the room. And it was a challenge because they thought I was staring them down and being intimidating and daring and stuff like that. So we had to get past that. I had to find other ways. I had to engage in conversation and look at my paper every now and then and look up. But these, these things do make a difference. All right, let's talk about some real resources. I mentioned earlier that there is just an abundance of resources in the Triangle area to help small business owners and entrepreneurs. Every community college in the state has a small business center. So there are 58 small business centers in North Carolina. There are five within driving distance of where you are right now. The Wake Tech Small Business Center is, of course, the largest in the state. The small business center offices are at Western Wake Campus. And if you were to Google Wake Tech Small Business Center, you would get to the page. Our small business center is and all of them provides free one-on-one -on -one confidential counseling for anybody in the county with a pulse. There are no requirements. We're funded by your tax dollars. You make an appointment, you come in, you talk to a paid professional counselor in a room where they can close the door. So if you're worried about your brand new ideas, you know, somebody over here, that won't happen. We are required to be in a private setting so you can't be counseled by a small business center counselor in a coffee shop, coffee room or in a break room. It has to be in an office. The Wake Tech Small Business Center, and I actually did some counseling in the small business center in 2013 and 2014 before I got this job. We see about 500 unique individuals a year. 
Some people have businesses and they've reached some kind of roadblock and they need some help. Some just started. Some are thinking about it and they need some help thinking through it and figuring out what to do to get started. We also offer about 140 free seminars every year. Half of them are at the Western Wake campus, held on Tuesday evenings, and half at the North campus, held on Thursday evenings. They're all free. These two things are all free. We do actually register for the seminars, though, because if something happens, like has happened a couple of times this year, we have a power outage or the internet is down, then we want to be able to let the students know so they don't drive over to the location and find that they can't, you know, there's no seminar. And as I mentioned, you are within driving distance of not just our small business center, but four others. The reason I list those is because if you find that you need, let's say, a Facebook for Business seminar, and ours happened two weeks ago, you missed it, you can check these other small business centers and see what they have to offer. It's a little bit more of a drive, but it's free. And so all you're paying for is the gas. The Wake Tech Wells Fargo Center for Entrepreneurship was formed about eight years ago with a grant from Wells Fargo Bank. That is a project that I manage. And it is aimed at offering deep dive intensive education and special events for entrepreneurs and small business owners. Now, most of what I do is not free because where you might spend two hours in a seminar learning generally about Facebook for Business, why you should use Facebook, some of the statistics. When I do a, a Facebook for Business class, it is in a computer lab, hands-on, where people come in and actually create their Facebook pages and learn how to do their security settings and learn about Facebook etiquette and actually try some things. So that's the difference between us. Small Business Center and I complement each other. So they, people whet their appetites in the free seminars they come to the Center for Entrepreneurship for the Deep Dives. You may find out what goes in a business plan in a two-hour seminar, then you would come to my eight-week class to actually write your business plan. And the eight-week class is not free, but I do have scholarships for deserving students. One of the things that um, we are offering this starting this year, going to launch, is a speaker series. And a speaker series brings thought leaders to you to share their wisdom and give people sparks of inspiration around their business. So I may pick somebody like, oh, I had a chance to get Michael Gerber. Do you guys know who he is? He's written 30 books on business. He wrote The E-Myth Revisited. I mean, those of us who counsel small businesses, that's like the Bible. So I might get somebody like him, or I tried to get Mike Rowe last year, but. It's to bring these people that you wouldn't ordinarily have a chance to hear speak in to speak. And they're typically free um, events that are funded or sponsored. Um, we, I also do things like this, presentations to community groups and classes as under the Center for Entrepreneurship, Fargo Bank. That is a project that I manage. And it is aimed at offering deep dive intensive education and special events for entrepreneurs and small business owners. Now, most of what I do is not free because where you might spend two hours in a seminar learning generally about Facebook for Business, why you should use Facebook, some of the statistics. When I do a, a Facebook for Business class, it is in a computer lab, hands-on, where people come in and actually create their Facebook pages and learn how to do their security settings and learn about Facebook etiquette and actually try some things. So that's the difference between us. Small Business Center and I complement each other. So they, people whet their appetites in the free seminars. They come to the Center for Entrepreneurship for the deep dives. You may find out what goes in a business plan in a two-hour seminar. Then you would come to my eight-week class to actually write your business plan. And the eight-week class is not free, but I do have scholarships for deserving students. One of the things that um, we are offering this starting this year, going to launch, is a speaker series. And a speaker series brings thought leaders to you to share their wisdom and give people sparks of inspiration around their business. 
So I may pick somebody like, oh, I had a chance to get Michael Gerber. Do you guys know who he is? He's written 30 books on business. He wrote The E-Myth Revisited. I mean, those of us who counsel small businesses, that's like the Bible. So I might get somebody like him, or I tried to get Mike Rowe last year, but it's to bring these people that you wouldn't ordinarily have a chance to hear speak in to speak. And they're typically free um, events that are funded or sponsored. Um, we, I also do things like this, presentations to community groups and classes as under the Center for Entrepreneurship. I'm speaking to a group of uh, students next month on a Saturday. And the reason for doing that is because if you really think about it, entrepreneurship is the backbone of our economy. Now I know when the cleaners <coughs> hires three more people, it doesn't make the Triangle Business Journal. But when Cisco lays off 200 people, it makes a Triangle Business Journal because it's a lot of impact all at one time. But over 90% of the people in this country work for businesses that will be classified as small businesses. And entrepreneurship is so key to our economy that I personally feel that everybody ought to know something about it. So if you think about those characteristics that we talked about, if you were hiring somebody, you'd want them to be able to communicate. You want them to have a work ethic. You want them to be accountable and responsible, right? So the entrepreneurial skills, this is my own philosophy, entrepreneurial skills and characteristics are the life and leadership skills of the future. And that's why we want to spread that message. Because where when I was starting my career, everybody expected me to get with a national company and stay there for 30 years and retire. That's not the pattern nowadays. The average tenure with the company nowadays is going to be four to five years. In fact, a lot of people are not even going for a traditional job. They're taking several part-time jobs and pacing them together and making their own position. Uh, one of the weekend receptionists at our Western Wake campus is an artist. She works for Wake Tech for 25 hours, kind of to stabilize her income, but her real focus is her art. So this part-time job frees her up to do her real thing. Uh, my daughter, who's an actor, well, mostly she's a bartender, but anyway, um, she works a job. She works so that she has time to audition and go do special projects and rehearse and things like that. So that's the new way of the world, and it's very likely that everybody at some point in their lives is going to be an entrepreneur. In fact, the word entrepreneur is not something that we used to just throw around every day like we do now. But there have always been those. When I was growing up, everybody in my neighborhood who had had a side hustle. Everybody was doing something extra. The teacher did hair on the weekend. The guy who worked in the factory fixed everybody's small appliances. Uh, my mother baked cakes and killed chickens for people who raised chickens and didn't want to get their hands dirty. You know, there was a guy who cut everybody's grass. They all had a side hustle. Then there was a guy who in his basement had the equivalent of a 7-Eleven. That was his full-time hustle. Everybody had a hustle of some size, of some type, but we didn't have the big word entrepreneurship. And I really think that we're getting back to that now because we now understand that the probability of going to work for Hewlett Packard or going to work for Duke Energy or any, even government has layouts now, right? The probability of spending 30, 35 years uh, working for someone in the future is slim that we're going to have to be more creative. And if you're entrepreneurial, even inside of an organization, you'll be more successful. So, so that's why I really believe in that. I want to tell you about another special project that I started last year that um, I kind of fell into, but now I've found that, boy, I really have a passion for this. I'm not a veteran. I took one semester of ROTC in college, but my veteran friends say, that doesn't qualify me. Um, we started the Veterans Entrepreneurship Program because North Carolina has one of the highest veteran populations in the country. I think we're maybe second or third because we have so many military bases. And the Triangle area, I've heard that we have 70,000 veterans in the Triangle area. A lot of these vets have business ideas and actually veterans make great entrepreneurs because of the, some of the things, the attributes they've developed from being in the military. So we got some funding to start the Veterans Entrepreneurship Advantage Program that 
pay, provide scholarships to every veteran to come to this eight-week business planning class. The class is taught by a veteran who's a business consultant. All of our guest speakers are veterans who are experts in their field, and we give them dinner. Because um, I have found that if I feed people that they'll come straight there instead of, you know, maybe going home or getting sidetracked. But anyway, it's a great program. I'm really excited about that. We've had three classes. We've had about 30 people go through. And we're planning three to four more this year. So if you know any vets, let me know. We also have some social media deep dives for Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We're developing one for Instagram, Periscope, and Blab. This is a new one. Um, one that's coming up real soon that you guys have a flyer for is sales for people who don't like to sell. Why that title? How many of you guys love to sell? Nobody? I mean, you really have, I'm like, not, really have to believe in the product, like completely 100%, and everything has its flaws. <laughs> right. Well, nobody says that they love to sell. In fact, there was a time in our society when selling was like, it was associated with door-to-door -door people and used car salesmen. When I was with IBM for a while, I was selling, but I couldn't call myself a salesperson. I was a marketing rep. That sounded more sophisticated. Nobody really loves to sell, so that's true. But there's something called consultative selling, which is not the image that we have of selling where we're pushing things on people who don't need it or want it, but where we're understanding what, what the clients need and really matching what we have to offer. And there's a technique and there's a process for that. So we have this deep dive for people who admit that they don't like to sell, but they have to because they have their own business and they have to generate revenue. They have to eat what they kill, I say. Then we have another uh, deep dive workshop coming up called Create Your Own WordPress Website. You have a flyer for that, I believe. We found that so many people had websites created and they were not maintaining them because they didn't know how or they wanted to create their own. So this is a, it's in a computer lab. You come in, you may not have, we had one person who hadn't even bought their domain name. We helped them pick a domain name, purchase it, set up their WordPress, and get it to the point where they could maintain it. They can go home then and make it pretty. And that's why we have a day between these, because on the first day you learn some things, you need to go do that. And then you come back the next day and we polish it off. And this is an example of the detailed things I offer in the Center for Entrepreneurship. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, for all these programs, the measurement of the effectiveness of the programs? Like, is, is there a way to, I mean, the success rate? Is, what is, like, what is what success? Do you define, yes, is success? We depend on critiques after the class from the students. Um, we are, we've taught about, we've taught our deep dive eight week course to about 400 people over the past seven years. And we're in the process of going back and measuring that now. Here's the reality that you can go through that eight week class and the main thing that you get out of it is an understanding that you don't want to do this, which is still a good thing because you've saved somebody time and money. One of the, the uh, students in my first veterans class, in fact, um, did just that. I require that at the last class period, they, they take 10 minutes, they stand up in front of the class with their PowerPoints and they pitch their business, kind of like a shark tank thing only more like a dolphin tank because it's really friendly. This guy was so funny. He was a Vietnam vet and he was the last one. I couldn't have planned it better. He went through about eight minutes of all the things he learned in the class, how much he liked it. I taught the first one. I always sit through the very first time we deliver a class. So he called me professor and I really appreciated that. Um, but when he finished talking about all that he had learned, he said, but the most important thing I learned is I don't want no parts of any of this. He said, I'm 65. I want to spend time with my grandchildren. I want to be responsible for all this money. I don't want to do all this paperwork. I don't want the stress. I'm so glad I came because I would have wasted a lot of time and money. What I want is to go get a job working for somebody who started a business like the one I wanted to start, and that's what he did. So it's hard when you measure the effectiveness of something, it's did it help them make better decisions? To me, that's a win. Either it's have a better, better um, probability of success starting a business, convincing them not to start the business, or helping them adjust their business plan so that it's more viable. Okay. Let me know when I start running out of time. 
because mama was a preacher and it's hard to do something in a, in a <laughs> uh, because we're funded by Wells Fargo I also want to talk about this Wells Fargo uh, in small business week of 2014 announced something called works for small business it's a website with videos and downloadable loadable reports that can help you as an entrepreneur and small business owner you see how much there is right there's a lot of stuff out there okay now we're getting past what you have right here at Wake Tech at Wake Tech you have the Wake Tech Small Business Center and the Wake Tech Wells Fargo Center for Entrepreneurship there are others out there available to help you as well there's the Women's Business Center of North Carolina funded by the Small Business Administration, the U.S. Small Business Administration. So while we were funded by state dollars, your federal taxes help fund the Women's Business Center of North Carolina. They provide free one-on-one -on -one counseling. They also have some free and some fee seminars. They help you with business plans. They help you package your loans. They help you get certified. If you were a service disabled veteran, you can get certified. If you are a minority, you can get certified as a minority-owned business, a woman-owned business. Um, and sometimes that helps you get in front of people who have said that we're going we're gonna to spend X amount of our outsourcing dollars doing business with this group of people. Um, and they provide networking, op networking opportunities. So why are there so many of these resources that do a similar thing? Well, sometimes it's accessible. The Women's Business Center used to be located in Durham. They're now in North Raleigh. But if you're in Cary, you may not want to always drive to North Raleigh. Also, if, if you played, if you were a professional golfer, you might have multiple coaches, right? You have somebody helps you with your, 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 with your long shot, somebody helps you putt, somebody works you out, makes sure you get your muscles in place. You might even have a stylist to make sure you look good on the green. So when you're a small business owner, you can have multiple coaches as well. You may come and talk to me and maybe, maybe we just don't have chemistry. Or <coughs> you pick up one thing from me, but when you talk to the small business center person, you pick up something else. But all of these are available to you, and as I mentioned, mostly free. Now, <coughs> just like every community college has a small business center, the 17 state supported universities have something called the Small Business Technology Development Center. They're a little bit different from us, from the small business centers, because if you're just thinking about a t shirt business that you're going to run out of your garage, probably better off with us. But if you're starting a manufacturing plant, developing, making over the counter drugs, and you need a million dollars just to build the building, you might want to go to them because they're really good at helping people get big chunks of money. So we all have our place, but there's an office at NC State on the Centennial Campus. There's one at UNC Chapel Hill, one at North Carolina Central. Every one of the, state, the uh, 17 state-supported universities have a SPTDC. And we cooperate and collaborate, all of us. We move people back and forth. If I know somebody over there who works in this program that specializes in helping people get government contracts, and I have somebody that I know should be going after some government contracts, like a construction business, I might send them to this guy. How many of you have heard of SCORE? Nobody's heard of SCORE? It's probably been around longer than anybody else. It used to mean Service Corps of Retired Executives. It no longer means that because they're not all retired and they're not all, not all executives, but it, they kept the acronym. But these are volunteers where with the Women's Business Center, our Small Business Center, and the SBTDC, you get paid counselors, that's their job. With SCORE, you get volunteers who want to help small businesses. And there are about 70 SCORE volunteers in Wake County. Here again, you can get free one-on-one -on -one counseling. They offer some seminars, and there are three chapters within driving distance. So when might you use SCORE? So at the Small Business Center and the SBTDC and the Women's Business Center, we're generalists. But if you wanted somebody who knew exactly how to 
manufacture cell phone cases or how to manufacture plastics, you might contact SCORE and say, do you have anybody who worked in this industry? And see if they can match you with somebody that has that specific background. So you may still be working with us, but you'd also be working with them. Now, those are your government-funded things. Let's talk about the things that are not funded by your tax dollars. Have all of you heard of meetup.com? It's a great resource. So if you're looking for uh, birds of a feather type environments, people who are interested in doing the same thing that you're interested in, people who are doing something that you're doing, uh, people who are doing things that you want to get into, um, go pick a meetup group. Business Networks International, BNI for short, it's a referral group. So a chapter might be 20 to 30 people. Um, if you have a graphic design business, you'd be the only graphic designer in that chapter. And the other members are supposed to, when they run across somebody who has a need for graphic design, bring that lead to you. And you do the same for them. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a leads group. There's something called Coffee and Contacts that's very similar to B&I, mostly women, but men, you're welcome. You probably get a lot of attention if you showed up because you might be the only one or two. And then, of course, I mentioned Toastmasters International. The reason that, that I list that as a networking group is because the people who are involved are people who are trying to be better at speaking. And the reason they're trying to be better at speaking is because usually they have a business need. When you have an area like the Triangle, where there are a lot of business starts, there are a lot of banks, there are a lot of technology companies, there are a lot of universities, and there are a lot of people, and I heard the other day that we're getting 63 new people um, to North Carolina every day. 63 people every day. And in Wake County, we're getting the equivalent of 2,000 kids um, every year, 2,000 new kids every year. So a lot of growth here, a lot of activity. Then you're going to have a lot of these types of groups. Um, have you guys ever heard of incubators and accelerators? OK. What does an incubator do? It grows something, takes something that can't really stand on its own, and helps it grow up to the point where it can be self-sufficient. I actually have an incubator in my office. Um, I incubate plants. I have six lemon trees in my office that started like this inside Ziploc bags and they're now like this because it's a great environment apparently <laughs> to grow lemon trees. Um, so this is a great environment to grow businesses and there are these incubators who take people with business ideas um, or people who have started businesses that need a little help and they put them in this cocoon of an environment called an incubator and give them all the help that they need. Um, these are co-working spaces. Some people call these incubators as well, but they're really not. Um, and, the, and the list is growing. For instance, there's a place called um, The Landing, The Landing Place that just opened in Cary. Um, Holly Springs co-working is opening up, which I'm really excited about because that's my little town. But these co-working spaces are there as a resource, and the reason they are important to you is because they cut your startup expenses. And they also address one of the biggest problems in being an entrepreneur. 
It's not getting funding. It's not even skills. It's isolation. If you're an extreme introvert, then and you, you feel very comfortable sitting at home by yourself all the time, then isolation is not a problem. Of course, you might have trouble getting <coughs> customers because you have to leave your home to get customers. But for most entrepreneurs, being suddenly in this, where you, it's all up to you and you're all by yourself, it's a problem. So the co-working spaces have grown very quickly because you can go there and you can be around other people. You have somebody to bounce an idea off of. You might find your next strategic partner there. You might find some customers there. You might find some suppliers there. Um, it gets you out of your office and puts you into another environment at a very affordable fee. And I wanted to go through some general support. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these. They each have their own little special place. Um, and you, so you'll find that if you decide to start a business, that you kind of find your own community and what works for you, where you fit. You're not going to be able to, to frequent all of these, but you just like finding a church or finding a gym or finding a group of friends to hang out with, you will find your community amongst all these things. And here are um, organizations that focus just on different types of technology. You guys have them on your list. You can look them up. And there are actually more of those. I found women in technology that I didn't know existed. Um, one great resource that we sometimes overlook is the public library. Does everybody in here have a library card? I only see, here, see one hand. Are there, <laughs> that's OK. You must get a library card. Um, all of, first of all, all the public libraries now have free Wi-Fi. Did you know that? So if you didn't want to pay anything, you could go to the public library and work. It's nice and quiet, right? And, and get all that information there. Um, Wake Tech has a small business library. We have very business-specific books that you can check out, and that's at Western Wake, around the corner of my office. Um, you can, if you graduated from one of the local universities as an alum, you can have access to their library. And the state of North Carolina combined all of these library resources into one website called NC Live. And what that gives you access to are these databases like Hoover's and uh, Reference USA and other business databases that you might have to pay a subscription fee for if you went out and did it on your own. But with your library card, you can have it for free. Have you ever noticed how lonely librarians are when you walk in the library? Right? People don't want to go up and talk to them. They ask a little question and they're gone. If you want to make somebody happy, ask a librarian for help finding something or doing some research. And the librarians at Wake Tech, especially at the Small Business Library, will help you navigate any of these databases. So if you needed to know um, how many businesses were in a five mile radius of your house because you're going to open a little cleaning business going in in the evening cleaning their offices there's a database they'll tell you that. If you wanted to know um, how many small independently owned businesses there were there's a database they'll tell you that and probably give you some basic contact information so your professional associations if you are going to be in an industry I suggest that you connect with your professional association. Lots and lots of good information there. 